Welcome back to the Canadian Rock, everyone. This is Jamie Gray. Uh, this pod, Canadian Rock, welcomes Kelly McCollum and Leslie McKenzie. Just let you know if I get distracted, I'm watching the Italy England game right now, and Italy just scored. It's uh, they're at five 0 It's pretty awesome. Uh, no offense to the English fans, but you know that's how it rolls. Anyway, uh, Kelly, as I say, Kelly McCollum, Leslie McKenzie are on. Kelly was a member of the 2002-06 Rugby uh, World Cup squad for Canada, elected in the BC Rugby Hall of Fame back in 2015. And she's a first female rugby player inducted to the BC Sports Hall of Fame in 2019. Uh, Leslie played Team Canada. She debuted in the Churchill Cup in 04 versus the US, 06 and 2010 Rugby World Cup squad. Uh, and she's currently the head coach of Japan's National 15s program and prepping them for the upcoming Rugby World Cup. As always, just a little plug here for ourselves. We're all over the social media. We're on the Canadian Ruck. Uh, sorry, we're on the Twitter, at Canadian Ruck. Instagram, the underscore Canadian underscore Ruck. Facebook, at the Canadian Ruck. And our email is the Canadian Ruck at gmail.com. Remember to, when you're listening, make sure that you're following, make sure that you're subscribing uh, anywhere that we play. We're on Spotify, iTunes, Google po uh, Podcasts, and CastBox. Uh, sorry, that game's, uh, I, I should probably turn that off. I'm losing my focus here. And we're also on YouTube, so you can actually see the rugby conversations uh, after the fact. So it's, uh, we're all over the place. And then we're also on, we also have our own website, the thecanadianrock.weebly.com, and everything is linked there. Uh, in case you want to go back and check out some past content, that would be great. Love to hear from you. Make sure that you reach out and let us know your thoughts on some of the pods, some of our guests, because we uh, we always like to get that feedback. Uh, uh, some bit some bit of things here in the in rugby news this uh, past week, and a couple things that struck my mind. First one, Six Nations. As I said, we're watching the uh, Ireland, sorry, the England Italy match right now, and England's close here. They're pushing on the five, trying to get in. Um, English definitely going to be looking to rebound after last weekend's to the Scots. I think there's a lot of people that were very excited for the Scots last weekend, me included. But we put our vote out 100% on Twitter and 86% on Eng uh, Instagram, all voting for England to win this match. And a lot of people wrote in saying it was going to be a, you know, a bloodbath. It's going to be 40 or 50 point spread. So we'll see. Up next will be Scotland and Wales. Scots are looking to keep riding high after last weekend's historic win at Twickenham. Uh, on Twitter, 85%, and on Instagram, 59% voted for Scotland in that match. Sorry, Brad Kirsted. And then tomorrow, we're seeing the last match of the weekend, Ireland versus France. This could be a key matchup. If France gets past Ireland, they'd be in good, uh, good, good place for the rest of the tourney. And on Twitter, 80%, and Instagram said 64% for France to win that match. So here's to a good weekend of rugby, and I uh, hope you get a nice chance to enjoy a, a couple of cold beers and watch some great rugby. Super Rugby. Uh, this is another headline I saw to implement golden try rule and bid to speed up the game. So this is Super Rugby Australia. They're making tweaks, um, I guess, to uh, add an extra time golden try and also 30 second restarts. What they're trying to encourage is actions, options, and less dead time. So some of the, th some of the things they're going to implement, a red card person can be replaced after 20 minutes. All right. I guess in their mind, if somebody gets redded in the first half, Instead of being down one man for you know upwards of sixty or seventy minutes, they're they're sinned for twenty minutes and then uh, they're they're back on after they will get a replacement player. The same guy can't come back. They're also looking at a five second law to move available ball from rucks, so no more delaying around the rucks. That ball they have five seconds to move it once it's play uh, once it's ready to go. A thirty second restart after points being scored. So that one's kind of neat. You get a try scored against you. You got to get up quick. Thirty seconds and go. And then scrum resets are going to be timed by the TMO to try and crack down on delays. They weren't really clear on what they're going to do there, but just having them timed to make sure that there's no time being wasted. Uh, New Zealand is implementing in, in uh, Aratora uh, a captain's challenge, and Australia just, they're not ready and prepared for that yet. So for me, all this seems to be in the sake of speeding up the game and putting the ball in the hands of the players more. From what I read last week in the Scotland-England game, only had 39 minutes of actual game time where the where players had ball in hand, and the rest of the time was ticked off between plays. So this is uh, Australia's way of trying to get more game time where the ball's actually in motion. And this one has uh, popped up as well, and this has been the talk of World Rugby here for the last couple months, but... Uh, the concussion issue. So Dr. Barry O'Driscoll believes rugby's concussion protocol is not fit for purpose. And this is what he said. It's got worse since I resigned. So O'Driscoll, who's a former medical advisor to World Rugby, is upset and worried about the state of injuries, 
head injuries in rugby. And he's not the only one. Uh, and this is what O'Driscoll goes on to say. In the nine years since I left World Rugby, we have become more relaxed about sending players with brain injuries back to the field. When the game has become more threatening and the players are bigger, heavier, and the knocks are huge. The HIA, so uh, in return to play protocols, have no scientific standard. The six-day return to play came in because the game went professional and there was pressure to get a player back for the next game. It was based on nothing else. We are damaging players' brains again and again. And unfortunately, the things that will happen to them won't happen for five years. Some won't happen for 20 years. There's no way of doing a test to see who, who will get multiple sclerosis, uh, epilepsy, anxiety, depression, or dementia from CTE. We do not know, but we do know we are abusing these young men. So Driscoll is on, is, he's on to something here, isn't he? The CDC, uh, Parachute.ca, and other health experts indicate typically it's 7 to 14 days before we return to normal. So if you look at the six-step six program, Six steps to return to play usually takes two to three days before it even starts because you have to be symptom free for 24 hours. So if you get knocked pretty good on a Saturday. Uh, you, chances are you're going to have even minor headaches on the Sunday or Monday. So you need a couple of days to kind of get your head back to normal. If it is O'Driscoll right since the program has begun, pro game, sorry, has begun, the players are being pushed into playing while concussed. Uh, that's some of the arguments right now. I used to personally advocate that World Rugby is leading the way in concussion management. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, I think we do a really good job uh, in rugby better than a lot of other sporting unions, but I don't think it's nowhere near where it should be. Um, concussions can take a long time. I've been battling post-concussion post syndrome since 2006, uh, probably earlier than that. And, you know, there are there are weeks on end and sometimes months on end where I can barely fun uh, focus and function. Uh, it makes it very hard to get through my workday and, and be normal around my family when I'm battling with different symptoms, whether it's irritability or feeling like I'm on a ship because I don't have any balance or um, massive headaches or tinnitus and, you know, depressive episodes and things like that. But then you so I, I don't even know what I'm trying to say there other than the fact that most of my concussions came from hockey, not rugby. But we're at the point now where the science is catching up that we need to do a better job of protecting our players when it comes to head injury because this, the, the pure science says that we need more time. Um, but beyond that, there's no actual testing to see what happens. As O'Driscoll says, what's going to happen in 10 or 15 or 20 years down the road, which is what's coming out in the news right now. Anyway, I hope it's something that uh, World Rugby can can get figured out and they take a right step in actually making better decisions safety-wise for player management. On the local side, uh, Canada's women's sevens drop head coach Tate. Uh, from what I can read, there have been complaints from players about Tate and Rugby Canada's brought in an independent investigator to handle the investigation. Rugby Canada CEO Alan Vinson stated this, of course, matters of employment and confidentiality are really important to us. I would ask you to draw your own conclusions. I can certainly share the complaints, that the complaints are from multiple individuals. It's surreal. So the independent reports, they're hoping is going to be finished by late March. And at this point, there's just been rumors and speculation as to why this happened and in Olympic year. Personally, I'm not going to add anything to the fire with unfounded accusations or gossip. Uh, it's going to have to play out and Rugby Canada is going to need to move forward as with those girls and Will Tate. Uh, as of now, Mitch Byrne has been named interim head coach. And this is my favorite read of the week. Of the week. Uh, Black community in Fredericton always had a home with rugby club. So I loved reading this. It's a nice article on CBC New Brunswick. So at my school, Rossi Netherwood, we've done a lot of things for Black History Month. I'm the teacher supervisor for a RISE committee, and RISE stands for Resist Injustice, Seek Equality. And it promotes anti-racism. So, so far for February, we've created intro videos. We've created... Uh, additional lessons for classrooms. We've created posters be hung around. We're doing many more student-led activities. Uh, very important things that we need to do to display anti-racism in our school and help students understand the issues at hand. But reading this article that was sent to, a, sent to me by a friend uh, yesterday, Andrew Stickings, sent me a text and said, you got to read this, you'll enjoy it. Uh, and it, it did, it gave me a big smile, ear, ear to ear. But 
the values of rugby shone through in Fredericton with the Loyalists back in the early 70s. Lloyd Payne started playing rugby for the Fredericton Loyalists in 1970, and he stated this in his interview. Color wasn't an issue at all. Even though there were several color, several color issues in the States, and I'm sure here in Canada as well, rugby escaped. Rugby had no boundaries at all. No matter who we played, it was all blood and guts at first and while you were on the field. And one of the few sports where you would beat everyone up and yet get together for a beer after the game. Payne said this, and he now still resides outside the Fredericton area. Dale Nash, a former teammate uh, of Payne's, who was also one of the first black players, followed up Payne's statement with his own. It was about the family feeling that you would get and that you would be who you wanted to be and everybody was okay with it because it was about sport and everybody coming together to do the best they could. And you read that and I just think, rugby, I mean, isn't it great? Just trans, you know, just pushing boundaries aside and stereotypes and racism and just bringing everybody together. So uh, thanks very much for, uh, you know, reading that article. If you get a chance and thank very much for the Fredericton Loyalists um, back in the 70s for doing things like that. And they continue to do things like that as well. And uh, it's a really cool article. And I really think that uh, you, if you have a chance, just search it up. CBC New Brunswick, Black Community in Fredericton always had a home with Rugby Canada. It's a great one. But it is middle of winter here in New Brunswick and golf season is coming up. Break prior golf sales and serve. And they're your authorized golf pride and Wilson dealer in Southern New Brunswick. So it's that time of year to get your clubs regripped to make sure that you're ready for the 2021 season. The new Wilson D9 driver is coming back soon, so pre-order yours now. Check them out on Facebook at Break Par Golf Sales and Service or on their website, breakpargolfsales.weebly.com. Break Par Golf, helping you break par, not your wallet. And coming up now is Kelly McCollum and Leslie McKenzie. So welcome back to the Canadian Rock, and we're very first. We got a we got a dual pod here. We've got Kelly McCollum and Leslie McKenzie on. Kelly's currently in New Zealand, uh, extensive background with Rugby Canada, and Leslie is in Japan, uh, currently coaching the women's uh, 15s program. We're very excited to have both of you on. Welcome to the Canadian Rock, ladies. Thank you. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks All right, so let's, let's jump right in here. It's, it's been a weird year. 2020 was weird. 2021 is starting out the same way. Let's talk about uh, what COVID has done on the rugby side, in your opinions. First one here, like, a lot of teams were trying to be innovative and there was a lot of teams getting burnt out. What are your thoughts around that, uh, Leslie? Ah, uh, this was the year that you, I think you don't want to be a social media um, manager or, or a community engagement officer for a franchise or for a national program because how much work on top of what you'd already been doing, do you now have to be engaging and positive and come up with all the content? So like, I look at that, what a nightmare gig. Um, I, I think that anyways, but as a coach, all of a sudden you're sort of thrust into how can I engage online? How can I be, I sound really old already. I'm not that old, but I think um, it did push us in, in some ways that we're not necessarily comfortable with to rethink how we message and what's a traditional way of doing things. And at the start, there was a huge foot race of everybody to be fun, engaging, check out some contests, uh, show us your trick pass, show us your best kick, and everyone just got fucking cooked. Sorry, you may have to take that out. Everyone got cooked um, in, the, in the initial couple of months. So you could see it popping up all over the social media accounts of teams that were suddenly locked down around the world. And then you thought, yeah, that's, that's going to burn out after a couple of months. Um, but that aside, like that's around community engagement with the teams themselves. It was really interesting talking to coaches um, and, and checking in. And we all sort of followed the same trajectory of how do we, how do we harness this and how do we be positive about it and how do we really like use this to accelerate ourselves and that's the rhetoric from everybody as well so sort of world rugby also are saying hey how, how can you come out of this better this is your opportunity and you just know they're saying that to everybody <laughs> so it was um some somewhere you can put pressure on yourself in an area that is unexplored there's no blueprint for it and uh yeah it 
to be honest, got a bit tedious, but at the same time, tedious can be on field day after day. So it's good. I'm sure we all came out of it better coaches. Mm -hmm. Still wouldn't want a job in doing social media engagement for anybody because they must be just ragged right. after that. And like same news day after day. I like your point about uh, just a little one you talked about just communicating with, with players and you you know, maybe I'm dating myself and I'm the same way. I mean, I'm a teacher. It's my 15th year and email is huge in our schools like university mm. and it's an independent school. So you know how to use email, you just, most of them do. They just don't check it. Yeah. Um, all my, pretty much all my students have my cell phone number yeah. and that, that was the way to contact was text. But now kids don't even answer text. I have to I have to follow them on Instagram and send them an Instagram message so that they respond. And it's like, I'm not getting Snapchat. I'm not getting TikTok. Come on, just answer my message for Pete's sakes, right? Do you have that trouble with, with the girls you coach or players you associate with? No, I coach in Japan. And if you contact them, they contact you right back. And that was a priority, actually, for... For me, in terms of the language barrier, you have to start building those bridges right away and, and making it a two-way communication because that's new for them. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's always been a priority for me is to be open with the players and to make sure that's a two-way street. And actually, here's my opportunity to give a shout out to Adam Martin, who is a rugby player, rugby head, secondary school teacher. And we had talked about social media with, with students way 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 back in the day and he said um you know just perceived levels of openness are real advantages for students to communicate with teachers kelly you might actually know a bit about that as well but i think i've i've made that sort of my priority is openness no barriers and honesty but boundaries obviously mm -hmm. can't it's good thoughts yeah I think, I think too like just being a teacher myself um knowing your team too is so important and how they like to relate. I had one class um, that I was teaching a paper with and they just zoned out with COVID. I really lost them through the thing. And then I had another complete other class that just loved the COVID experience, being online, being at home, finding out how, how to do things. So like knowing what your team and how your team gels and what they like. Yeah. So important. I think that's it's really neat, Kelly. Like, can you talk to us about that, about being adaptable and mentally able to manage yourself as an athlete, as a coach, uh, as a professional, like what are, what are some ways that you have seen people like Leslie or people that are, are playing currently professionally or semi-pro or what have you, how they've been mm. able to adapt and mentally be, be prepared at any given moment? Um, so is this in the COVID terms? Are you talking or? Sure, yeah, yeah, like over the last year. Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess for me <laughs> being in New Zealand, as most people know that there hasn't been really, we haven't really had that pressure um, because we literally had a six week lockdown and that was it. That's, that's, that, was, that, that was earlier. So um, I think it's just the uncertainty that we're trying to deal with more because we're actually not involved with it. We're not involved with the, the social distancing and the masking. So it's just the uncertainty is in the back of everyone's mind and it's just what you can't control. And just like keep talking to people saying we can't control what the outcome is going to be. It's uncertain, it's international. Um, we just need to day by day and just keep going moving forward because then certainly you can't it's you know it's, it's a wicked problem there's a researcher keith grint that just wrote out a really good article on the three different types of article uh problems you got being wicked and critical and that we're in a critical situation it means huge uncertainty so his research is about that collaboration is the best as leadership is best answer for that so bring people in talk to people that's the way to get through uncertain problems so um, we try and go. We try and go by that a lot in my teaching and my lecturing. We found um, we did a we had an uh, an occasion where we had a physical camp scheduled, and it was sort of the five day usual physical camp. And then the decision was made um, partly out of our hands, partly by our decision to front foot it and say this is a trend that we're seeing in terms of anxiety and and cancellations. Mm -hmm. And so let's just flip it now and move to an online format. And obviously you've got to change your format and you've got to change a lot of the content and the way you deliver it. You use it now on Zoom. But I found it really stimulating in terms of the opportunity now becomes um, players can express themselves. They've got a platform, there's time, there's no 
sort of element of of moving from one on field location to the next meeting to the next meal to the strapping and we learned so much about each other and just um hearing the players talk about things that we just hadn't had the time to dig into in camp was really cool and it was the first time for a lot of them as well we structured it for that it was difficult getting getting some of the tougher things out of them to start with but a couple of girls were brave and then the rest followed and uh, I think that moved us forward it actually propelled us having to change that the format and change the tone of it so we owe we owe a bit to COVID in that sense I think it pushed us along well, that's nice you're finding positives right like it, I've had a fair number of uh, rugby players who have been very willing to share experiences with me because they were locked out of their sport and it made it mm. really interesting to, to, to connect with those guys, but they also um, were also missing the team environment. So what, what are things that were, you've had to shift in areas like your coaching and training, you just, you kind of touched on it there, Leslie, but what have you been, what have you been doing with your national team? You get the world cup coming up soon. How are you getting those mm. girls prepared? Well, we had about a, we had a, I think it ended up about five months where we could not be with each other. So some of them were allowed to train in individuals or pairs or small groups, like, like everywhere. And we sort of, we periodized that. So initially for the first month we did four weeks of challenges. And that's what I was saying before, like, you just kind of, Oh God, I've got to be creative and fun and engaging positive. Like, what am I going to do? How am I going to sell this? So we did, a bit of a cycle where we started with um, challenges and we allocated points for the teams and this and that. And then we made it more of a unit focus. And then we shifted to some personal reflection, some more personal accountability and whatnot in the later stage. So we tried to sh keep shifting the focus so that it kept pushing where we engaged with them and how we challenged them and sort of try to get a little bit deeper and deeper and then luckily we were able to have a camp in september so i was running out of ideas by that point <laughs> it's hard to keep <laughs> things fresh when you constantly have to read things it might have been but something it's cool. like they came back they came back actually they had grown like they had genuinely grown in the time yeah. and that was a big concern so the other thing was it canceled the seven series over here mm. which is physically small in them like they get leaner they get lighter mm -hmm. um they start picking up a, a few over training type things so they came back grown in both senses which is outstanding for us but it's you probably know, so go ahead kelly no i was just i was just thinking i think the most and less through me like less and i chat all the time and i think just from seeing what you the stuff you've been doing one of the biggest positives of covid is coaches have had to think about relevance to the game what mm. how can i transfer stuff at home that's going to be relevant for the games like so many times we go out in training and we spend you know three quarters of it on scrums or back plays and stuff and is that actually relevant to the game what we have to work on so yeah it's been really interesting to see the ideas coaches come up and it's all about relevance you know is this going to transfer to the game because that's all we have we can't actually get onto the field to practice it so it as it needs to be absolutely relevant so a lot of your ideas less that you've been doing are just awesome yeah thank you Kel. I think we're not sharing it because we have World Cup coming up. Yeah. <laughs> but it is about, it's, you know, you talk about relevance and there's so many people that are just ingrained in them is training to train. So the training to pass and pass and pass and pass and kick and kick and kick and kick. And then um, I guess, especially in some of the, the rugby, the less rugby literate nations where you might come from another sport or you might not grow up in an environment where rugby is the language um sometimes you just take those discrete elements almost out of a training montage and you say right that's how i'm gonna get better and then the challenge when you've got this kind of time is to push them and say how you, how does that connect to your game like what is what about this is going to improve you as a player rather than just yeah i've got an immaculate pass at eight meters um i can do that 52 times in a row but you know and it's challenging your girls or your players to then connect it into what's your job how is she going to respond what are you going to do next when are you need to use it so yeah Kel, like i think just the, the breathing space for coaches and for athletes to really integrate shit that they need to be 
integrating it's a cool challenge to contextualize that yeah it's probably neat too because what you probably did over those five months was develop a new skill set as a coach where now you've probably got different ideas that can last you for years yeah, it, it, yeah. so i think that that's really good um so true kelly you're in new zealand right now the world cup's coming up and yeah with covid happening how is that hampering things like i i watched Argentina beat New Zealand in the Tri Nations after not playing for 13 months in New Zealand had you yeah. know, Super Rugby yeah. and then they had played Australia a few games and then lo and behold they lose for the first time ever to Argentina. Does that is it a change in mindset as to how you train and prep for these big events or I mean I'd like to say it was a fluke but I don't think it was because they tied Australia a couple of times they gave New Zealand a run for their money later on like what are your thoughts around that? I know, because I had to think about that, because it's all about test games, and you know, um, when we were in Japan, and I was when I was coaching uh, in Japan too, it was about we're not getting enough test matches, test matches. But then Argentina comes, and then you know, beats the All Blacks, who've had more test matches. So that's the big question: what's going on, and what is actually relevant um, to what they were doing as a team, um, mentally and physically. Um, so they can take down all bucks. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. Les and I have talked about this heaps. I would less probably have more on this, but what do you think, Les? Um, that it's set the bar for everybody. Like, unfortunately, there's no excuses anymore for anything. So you can't say like, oh, we haven't really had a test calendar. Um, but how exciting to be able to look at that as a as an example of what you can achieve, what a program can achieve. Um, similar to what Uruguay did at the World Cup. Mm. So they're just giving us these shining examples of ways that you can galvanize a program and produce a really stellar performance. And then the trick is always going to be, how do you back that up? So I think a team like Argentina, and this is me completely talking from ignorance, like we don't, we don't know anything about what it's like in the Argentina camp, but you look at that and you think they have to have a big game in their pocket. And if you're going to pick a big game it, out of that series, it's going to be the first one against New Zealand. So why wouldn't they have a big game there? So um, I reckon that's a program that, that feeds on emotion. Mm. And hey. that, why not? Why wouldn't it be that one? Yeah. And, you know, there's obviously a billion reasons that have been posited about why All Blacks didn't come into that humming. So by smarter minds than ours. Well, yeah. I think I think you're right. Argentina does play an emotional game, and mm. you know, maybe they had 13 months of pent up frustration because they didn't fare too well at the last World Cup. So maybe it was something like that. But then you look at South Africa, who decided to stay home, mm. and you mm. know now they've been, geez, 16 months since a test test match, right? So it's how do you know what to do at this at these points and and points in life, right? With with everything that's happening. So I think also. Um, the other thing is it's actually not that important. Like it's not as important anymore and people maybe recognize that. So all of a sudden playing a test match is not as important as having a community that's safer Safe. or um, yeah. having the freedom to go outside. Like I think it's put things into perspective for people. So yeah. I think there, it's not as, as tenable a look to be moaning about your test calendar when there's so much difficulty going on for so many people and i'm not just talking about people in hospital beds but there's been a huge mental toll on a lot of people around the world mm. and um yeah. yeah i think it just keeps us all on the right side of shutting up when we need to because it's not important anymore it's not as important i better not say that i might not have a job <laughs> yeah. who, who, who pays you there <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, you make a really good point, though, because here in North America, uh, football's still going on. Some stadiums have crowds. Basketball's going on. Some arenas yeah. have crowds. The NHL starts tonight. Some arenas are going to have crowds. Uh, Canadian teams aren't allowed to travel to the states, and the states aren't allowed to travel into Canada. So we have a Which full Canadian division. Brilliant for the NHL. That's awesome. And I'm finally going to subscribe again to NHL.com because I want to watch. My, that. my Leafs are starting tonight against the Habs. I think puck drops in like ten minutes or something. So <laughs> <laughs> really, um, it, yeah. Actually, I was talking uh, on another note with, game, and it also put emphasis on um, how important to play games because, and I only know from back home, parking from home, my nephews. Uh, place for BC water polo and they've had no games but they've practiced over and over and over and he's actually losing motivation 
interns, they practice five days a week, um, but they can only pass and they can only swim and yeah. they can't do any content or anything. So it, it is interesting pulling out the game aspect of it and how much game, the emphasis that games actually have on motivation um, and the importance of it. Yeah, yeah whether they're small sided games or, you yeah. know, finding a game just to keep that motivation going through these times where, yeah especially when you get younger like I'm at the high school level and uh, throughout the first half of the year soccer was allowed to be played but there's no throw-ins you had to kick it in um, basketball mm. was allowed to be played which was weird because they're sharing the same ball no masks yeah. things like that hockey was allowed to be played um, but when we go in, in New Brunswick we have different phases and orange phase is us is our second worst and that's what we're in right now so when it's an outbreak so you have to have your masks on 24 7 indoors and out you're not allowed to visit people things like that yeah, yeah, I see the look of your face, Leslie. So I'm teaching to you know, my class with a mask on, and there, and it's, it's, it, it, you don't think it's a big deal, but it does get tiring trying to talk through a mask. And I've got friends that yeah. are a couple of friends that are surgeons, and I'm like, I don't know how you guys do this four or five hours straight, mm -hmm. you know. And he, and, he, and he says, Well, I'm not talking and teaching 25 people at the same time. I've got a room of like five, and I don't really talk a whole lot. <laughs> I'm like, Okay, fair enough, but still. Yeah. Um, but it, it, some of the kids, when, it's, when we're in orange phase like we are now, the, those are prep athletes really struggle because it's, they're working on skills, which is great, but there's no payoff at a game on the weekend or a game on a Tuesday night. It's yeah. just practice, 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 practice. So, yeah, definitely. Mm. Let's talk a little yeah. bit about coaching different populations. Like, I know, uh, Leslie, you've coached the 7s Jap Japanese team and you know, the 15s Japanese team. What – what are some differences like coaching in different countries or coaching different genders? And, you know, I've coached in cities, I've coached provincially, I've coached in smaller areas. What's it like to coach, I guess, across different gender populations, age populations, et cetera? Kel, do you want to start? <laughs> uh, Les and I always talk about this because, um, well, yeah, in terms of coaching gender, male and female, and uh, for example, story. One of the um, Sport Northland's a big uh, sporting organization here, and they asked me to come in. They had a guy from Aussie coming over to talk about getting people together and talking them, getting them together and telling them how to teach women rugby players as opposed to men rugby players. And he he asked me, he said, "Oh, Kel, it'd be really good if you came in and said your two bits of how different it is to teach females and males." And I said, "Well, you've got the wrong person because I won't, I won't <laughs> go to it." You know, I just well, it's. For me, and I've taught male and female, and for me, it's the coach. It's the coach that goes in, like, male and female. We ask more questions. To, we say women ask more questions, but it's only because we ask more questions because we think they ask more questions. So it all perpetuates in itself. Um, I think but male and female see through a coach. You just, you got to go in there as you coach, and your team will attract, just like teaching, you know. You can't be teaching females different in a classroom or males. As a leader, you can't go into an organization and say, oh, all the females over there, I'm gonna lead you this way. I'm gonna lead the men this way. And they say, coaching and leading, there's no difference, and teaching. You're talking about being so, authenticity, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So a lot of times coaches will ask me, and my students will ask me, because I coach, and, uh, coach the coaches, and they say, well, how do you do? I said, you just go in, just go in yourself. Go in as yourself and you coach and that's what they'll see you know some teams you're not going to click with some of them you will um, but if you go in very way and you try and coach a certain way because they're male or female you end up failing so yeah you've mm -hmm. got to like we we talk about this a fair bit because it is it's a trope that gets thrown around a lot in um when you are in groups that are around developing women's coaches like i am in a grab bag of those and and there's always oh well like women do ask questions more like because they haven't been taught so we don't have necessarily the background um or women female athletes don't necessarily have the technical tactical background because nobody has actually put that resource into their technical tactical learning so of course they're gonna ask questions and as individuals possibly they're more comfortable with the idea of putting themselves out there being a little bit vulnerable and asking the question and but that's an individual thing so there's women out there that will not ask questions because they don't want to be shown up as oh, i don't know this same with dudes um if you know your players then you can be responsive and sensitive to what they need and it's got to always come back to what do your players need what do they want what do they need right it's not always what they want it's not always the same thing but um 
it's so simplistic otherwise and it's you end up making some assumptions that just puts people in boxes and i was talking about lecturing to people like nobody would do that in a university lecture like well, i'm teaching women's world history from 1500 like you don't do that because mm. uh, you'd be laughed out of the industry but somehow it's okay mm. here whereas why can you not just look at your group of individuals and say like what's the common denominator what do they need um how am i going to give that to them and then move from there so mm. lots of different motivations and different players and some of that doesn't come with asking questions some of that comes with i want to show you things but i've not found that to be greatly different either in males or females mm. or it's japanese or canadians or new zealanders like you've just got to identify what is it that they need and how am i yeah. to give that the best experience to them to help that. That's great. What one of the things, like one of my coaching philosophies is that I coach high school, I coach provincially, but my, my ideal uh, ideology was, you know, winning doesn't matter unless you're a professional because at the high school level, provincial level, you don't get paid. It's about growth. It's about skills and things mm -hmm. like that. And one thing I always preached was that we need to have good character on our team. And mm -hmm. if you can't, be a good character person, teammate, person in general, then you're not welcome. You're not, I'll work with you as much as I can to try and change your character. I don't care how skilled you are. Um, yeah. A lot of people don't like that. A lot of people think, well, that's not right. You need your skill set and things like that. I'm always open to changing my ways. What do you, what do you two think? I mean, you, you coach at way higher levels than I do than I ever will. Is there, is there a line where you draw, like, you know, you, you're, you know, you could be the next boat in Baird, but you're, you're a real jerk and nobody likes you. I know that this is a little, little off topic, but it just kind of, the way we were talking about, it just kind of, to me, it kind of led into that. It's mm. a good question. Um, I wonder if you've got somebody who's a real jerk, what's their motivation for being there? What makes them a real jerk? Um, mm. Can you pick that apart a bit? If they're determined to be a jerk, odds are the teammates aren't, going to want to play with them mm -hmm. and that is going to be reflected in the product on the field but if there's something about them like even some of the most maligned people in sport have teammates that would back them you know any like day where yeah so mm -hmm. um, i guess it just people are people are people and i've never really come across somebody that you just would dismiss completely because there's always more to somebody. There's something behind somebody. Sometimes maybe that doesn't fit with how they can work within a team, but that doesn't mean that they're, they're should be cast aside. Salvageable, eh? Yeah. I mean, can you? That's that's your task, and it you're not going to succeed necessarily with everybody. But I've, um, yeah, Kel. Yeah, I was just thinking. I was just um, reading something recently that kind of came up. It comes along that line. Jamie is like. A good leader um, finds out an individual's end result, what they want out of it, and they hitchhike themselves to their will rather than hijack. So they kind of hitchhike themselves on their shoulder and they help them find that end. Exactly what you were saying, it's finding their character and finding the way that they can get to that goal. Whereas a lot of coaches like to hijack, right? They just like, this is where we're going, this is, and that's. You're going to get me there. Open. What's that? You're going to get me there. <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, exactly. So if you hitchhike the person and you kind of guide them and, you know, you're just guiding them along their way to their, what their goal is, and you are, you, yeah, you're helping them with their character and knowing, but also the goal of, you know, also have the goal of the team and the values of the team and stuff. But it was just interesting to say rather that that difference with hitchhiking someone versus hijacking someone as a coach. Yeah, that's it's interesting. Good. I like that. Yeah. What areas do you see for growth in the women's game on the pitch? Uh, attention uh, professionalism things like that is is there i think there's an opportunity for growth how do how mm. do we get there huge opportunity for growth and mm. i think we are seeing we're seeing some real up, upswings at the moment like i think in refereeing for example there's a few girls um i think holly davidson is one who's just refereed her first premier game in the uk and there's a few other referees in rugby league as well as rugby union who are now at the professional stage. So I think refereeing is a massive area for, for women to become more visible, more involved and take sort of 
professionalism in the women's side of, of participation higher. I think obviously coaching is an area that World Rugby have decided that they want to focus on. Um, and there's sort of nowhere to go but up with that because there's so few of us, to be honest. And it's mm. more at grassroots, but I think there's a lot to be done around unpicking sort of what are the barriers and um, some of those are self-inflicted. Like I'm not here to say poor us, we've not got this, this or this, because I think a lot of uh, um, projects are really well funded, real, well thought out now. Um, but I'd say on the field, there's opportunity because you're still seeing in the women's game, like it's very it's there's a lot of placed um places to sort of develop from where we are it's very size and power in a few countries at the moment it's very sort of skill oriented where i am at the moment but that lacks size and power so i think across the board there's nobody that would look and say we've reached the pinnacle um possibly england mm -hmm. might say that but don't think they're there yet um, but I mean, you know, like it's just sort of where the, where the men's game isn't at its pinnacle yet because it keeps changing. And I think the evolution of laws and the evolution of how people are coaching the game, it keeps evolving. So, yeah, it's just up to us to get along with yeah. that and not I wait, not sit and, want, you know, hope to be developed. I think, there's, um, I think there's thousands and thousands of people like me, like who I would be coaching in a second if I didn't have the full responsibility of doing every weekend and twice a week. I've mm -hmm. got girls, you know, two girls, a 13 year old, 11 year old. Um, I've got my work and doing that. But if someone said to me, hey, Kel, we only need you uh, once a week or once every couple of weeks, where can you contribute? There's a thousands of, of me's out there that actually would give that. And it's, it's trying, that's a barrier to a lot of, to women is, is to, because rugby is a full, like sport is a full commitment, isn't it? Weekends, um, trainings. Um, but I think we're not using all the knowledge that all these people have, you know, men included too. That, but then why that don't you just rock up to a club, Cal, and say, I'm available for one day a week. I'm here to do your starters from scrum. Like, give me a job. Because there's people on the yeah, other side. I worked in, in rugby mm -hmm. development in New Zealand for six years. And yeah. we were always sort of, we were short of coaches. We were under resourced through the clubs and we just kept trying to make it like, how can we make it more amenable for people to come along? So I think um, if there's thousands of views, they should. I know, but how do you do that? that? It's like, I, go, I do that. that. You gotta wait till we're you know, through the World Cup and you've supported us. <laughs> then you can go. <laughs> But you know, you're, you're like I do. I go up, and it's this, and then it's like, oh, we have no one to coach Thursday. Can you coach Thursday? And you're sitting there going, all right, here we go. <laughs> I'm coaching Thursday now. Oh, uh -huh. Yeah. So you need it to be not the thin out of the edge of the wedge. It, it, it's, yeah. it's under it's under resourced, and it's people who are stretching themselves thin. So a lot of the guys that I worked alongside of would be coaching multiple teams. Mm -hmm. And when it comes time mm -hmm. to the end of the season and you've got your junior teams that need rep coaches. You're toast. You know, or minimum mm -hmm. numbers that can support each other. No, you, you're not, they're not toast because these people are, they're superhumans and they're there to give back <laughs> to them. You call the same people and you say like, we need you to get alongside this person. We need you to help with this program. And they do it. But, um, they, they end up being there for so long that everyone looks and thinks, oh, yeah, that's ticked. I don't need to help. Yeah. And that's where, I don't yes. know if the discussion needs changing or the rhetoric or the, like, Cal, you're saying maybe the format needs to change so that um, there's an understanding or an appreciation of, of yeah, dude, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I like both. There's nothing fast. more intelligent people than I have looked at, so. <laughs> Don't sell yourself short. I like both of your thoughts there. Yeah. Like Leslie, like seriously, if you want to help out, go to some clubs and say, I'd be willing to do this one day a week. But Leslie or Kelly, I hear your side as well. Um, you know, I'm making this commitment, but then all of a sudden the phone starts ringing because, oh, by the way, oh, by the way, oh, by the way. And it will. It yeah. will. Yeah. It will. And, and, like, and we know it happens. And yeah. then what do you do? Right? You don't want to be the jerk that says, oh, no. But at the same time, yeah, it's exactly. like if I say yes, <laughs> like they're you yeah, know yeah. my my kids. What about my family? What about I had this plan? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's one of those things that's just tricky all the way around. 
it's yeah. why you've got to put so much resource like national bodies provincial bodies have to put so much resource into coach development they have to make it um, meaningful they have to make it accessible they have to make it entertaining they have to make it rewarding mm -hmm. they have to prioritize it and you look at new zealand as an example of a country that has prioritized coach education coach development for years and they are currently reaping the benefits or they have reaped the benefits um, and they need to make sure that they don't lose that edge and they've suffered a lot from from funding cuts and whatnot um, as yeah. many other countries have but when the first things to go are your coach development, your coach education, your coach appreciation schemes, your connection. Everything goes downhill. Um, because then the player's experience suffers and then people blame the unions because mm. that becomes the easiest target. But I mean, the unions is a real nebula nebulous target. So um, the, the priority has to be the education, the experience that coaches bring to it and yeah. the enjoyment to get out of it and that's it's, where i think it's mm. a cut but it's a deep one i don't know what it's like where you two are but here it's it's pretty disorganized at rugby can and i i love rugby can i love watching hey i love watching <laughs> you allowed to say that i i, I don't <laughs> work for rugby canada <laughs> they don't even they don't even follow me on any social media <laughs> oh, <safe then. laughs> I, I should maybe I should back up because I am supposed to be doing stuff with Jamie Cudmore in the Pride, but I, I oh you're editing this so you'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I I did my level two like three and a half years ago, and yeah. they still haven't yeah. updated it or sent me my qualifications. And I've like everything's been checked off. I've been signed off in New Brunswick, but it's it's like you know if I wanted to do my level three, it's not going to happen because yeah. Rugby Canada shows that well he doesn't even have his level two. Yeah, like and you lose that momentum. You lose that sort of yep. drive that exactly. you've been told. Of. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. That's a huge issue. And then I would not. I would not be surprised if you found that those people who are running that, or maybe sort of thinly resourced and sort of under motivated and whatnot. So, you know, which building do you storm? <laughs> hmm. Not the U.S. Capitol. We'll leave that. Not one the U.S. Capitol. We've done that before. <laughs> All right, so well, here's a, oh, oh sorry. no, you go ahead. I was yeah. just going to say, Jay, I don't know if you're aware, but Les is, uh, knows, but New Zealand uh, sport has just put uh, the top uh, five sports that will go completely non-rep under 16s. So rugby's one of them. So rugby, there will be no rep teams under 16 being what's, played in New what's Zealand. What's the focus on that? Like, what's the they're driving for? Balance is better. Balance is better. So, so play they multiple want them sports. To play multi sports multiple sport to 16 so they have erased all rep um yeah hockey football uh, field hockey football yeah. rugby there are yeah. a lot of parents that are going to go absolutely nuclear about that decision like mm. there's no doubt in my mind there is going to be absolute like hydrogen what, what do you think of it but it's the parents yes. um parents place their mm. primary importance on it and they're the ones on the sideline and they're the ones that, um, you know, the kids, it really matter. It matters to the kids. But I've always been the communist in the union about this. <laughs> and it's not because I hate under 14, under 15 reps, under 13 <laughs> reps, whatever, under 11 reps, whatever. But like, what is the point of telling a kid when they're 12 that they're not good enough to do something? What's the point? What do you get out of it? Or the opposite side of that, what's the point of telling a kid at 12, you need to quit other sports and focus on this? percent yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 exactly yeah that's one of my pet yeah. peeves as a coach is that for me when people say you're a multi-sport athlete to me it just makes no sense it's just jargon do people say that to you jamie do they say you're a multi-sport athlete they, i used to be okay. <laughs> i don't know how to take that no one ever said that to me right no, no, it. but in canada now that's the thing or it, where i'm from anyway in new brunswick is that you're a multi-sport athlete if you play more than one sport in my opinion it just means you're an athlete because ah. you play more than one yeah sport. Totally. if you totally. only play one sport yeah. you're a basketball player or you're, you're a hockey player or you're a rugby player what have you but in here at least it's uh, you know you get kids that are 14 years old that are they're committed like well, I'm, I'm only allowed to play basketball my coaches won't let me do otherwise my parents won't let me do otherwise yeah. Yeah. i'm only going to play hockey and work out because i'm going to go to the nhl and but when you get to the end of that road and you sometimes cannot choose the end of that road then you're left with fewer resources aren't you yep. sort of psychologically and whatnot yeah. i think 
yeah. if you are like in New Zealand, they're deep into their rugby, obviously. And people are deep into their rugby and they're not going to take this as a, well, I guess I'll go off and play field hockey. Like that's not going to happen. Um, mm. But I reckon like Wellington rugby, Rick Fatarau did a really good job when he took over sort of rep team management. And he coached for Natasha Wesh at Western for a few seasons. So he's got sort of deep Canadian connection over several years, over oh, well over a decade, two decades now. But he always prioritized participation. Oh, Rick Sturkel. Yeah. Was, um, yeah, yeah. So participation in a rep program was good for Wellington rugby because he expanded things into Wellington Māori and Wellington Samoans and women's Wellington Māori and women's Wellington Samoans and um, Western Bay. Like they have multiple rep programs and it, you know, some people get the nose out of joint and say, oh, it takes away the prestige of wearing a Wellington jersey. But at the same time, what is the positive? You get more people playing in a jersey, in a yellow and black jersey for longer. Yeah. Like, how is that not going to help the sport, help the yeah. game ultimately in Wellington? So Way more numbers. flip it and say you don't have to play other sports because some people don't want to, but you take away that narrowing process in the process of exclusion, especially for young kids, which, you know, what's the point of that? We all know that early specialization now isn't the guarantor to fame to and do riches. Anything. Yeah, Hundi. And you look at all the guess, science. Sorry, go ahead, Kelly. Yeah. No, I was just saying one of my colleagues um, uh, was some of the research behind that balance is better. And his he did um, field hockey players, 10, the top 10 uh, New Zealand black sticks. And he tracked what they did. And they actually were um, multiple sport all the way until they were, I think, 20, all of them. And they became uh, field hockey New Zealand players. Um, but interesting bit, they all also had a common theme, which he didn't include in his research, but all, every single one of them, five of the females that made the New Zealand Black Sticks team had um, played rugby, women's rugby. Nice. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah interesting. It is. It's the interesting thing, right? Like I have Brad May has been on my podcast. He played 19 years in the NHL, but he played rugby in high school, played U15 for Ontario. There's been a mm. few others, right? It's, when when you talk to these people or talk to kids and say, well, you know, other people have played rugby and have played, made it to the NHL. Like it's, there's so many scientific articles around, you know, uh, overuse injuries from playing one sport or how playing different mm -hmm. sports helps your mental aspect or it helps you with your awareness on the ice or on the field or on the basketball court or what have you. But I, yeah, I, yeah it's just one of those things you just butt heads with parents and coaches quite a lot, right? Yeah. yeah, those are the hijackers, aren't they? That like, we're talking about, like, those are, you know, people with, this is going to be the narrative, this is what I want, this is what I've always wanted. Um, yeah. yeah. And there's lots that aren't like that. I'm just being a bit of a dick, <laughs> generalizing, but yeah. It's ones you have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. All right, so we're at a section now where we do a quick fire, and I've got about 10 okay. questions here. Kind of fun, but it, it's just, it's going to pit each of you against each other. Um, just for fun. <laughs> And I, yeah. I think if this was in person, the three of us here, I think it would be a lot of fun because I imagine you two might drop the gloves and start throwing some punches, but I'm not sure. That should win. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you ready? Okay. Question yeah. one. Who has the best nickname? I never had one. What? Uh, yeah. My count, my, yeah. Oh, my God. What? I remember. What you you asked ask about... 2006 World Cup, what I do clearly remember is going to a, some kids, some classroom in Edmonton, and they were like, who's got the best nickname? And we were like, oh, well, uh, Crips is Crips, and uh, I don't care if you were there. Kel is Kel, and <laughs> Leslie's <laughs> Kel. And then the Kel only one left was Christy Heemskirk. In oh, the yeah, crack. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Right. So, so 0 for 1 in these questions so far. Yeah, right? sorry. <laughs> okay. Next so, who played with the most skill? Kel. Clearly. Uh, I'm a back, though. 100%. <laughs> You're going to ask about knock on Zoe. Best can throw a line out like anything. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Who is going, uh, of the two of you, who would be better at stopping a 2v1? Me. Leslie. Okay. <laughs> Very confident there, Leslie, too. <laughs> All right, so I think I know what the answer is for this. Who is the best tackler? 
Good oh. one. Yeah. That's good one. <laughs> we're both good tacklers. Yeah, we're never, right. we're ne we'll never know now. That's right. No, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> and who was the first to do an Back in the day. Up and less. Up and oh, less. Kill, less Oh, Kelly, who was that? Who was the first to do a knock on? Kelly. That's oh, why we scrum all the time. I drop nothing. <laughs> I pass <laughs> them, but I drop nothing either. Hey, last in my water polo hands. Come on, water polo hands. <laughs> who was the first to get carded? Who would have been the first to like to get Matt? Leslie's light, light oh, kind of putting her hand up. 2003, I got carded. In yeah, if you Vancouver. mean like first chronologically. No, 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 no. I mean like a yellow card or a red card. In the game. Oh, probably me. Oh, who would? Leslie would get it before me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I, did, I think I got it. Who got away with the most on the pitch? Me. Yeah, she's smarter. <laughs> Sorry, I've got a fly <laughs> buzzing around my head. <laughs> With not getting away with it is getting your yellow card. Yes. <laughs> All right. Who would get in the in trouble with the coach more? Kelly. Oh uh, me, me. I got in trouble uh, with coach lots. Yes. Leslie, do you have to say that because of your role now or no, not at all. I actively yeah. encourage trouble with the coach. It's <laughs> not trouble, but at least genuine conversation, not conflict. Mm -hmm. Robust conversation, nice definitely. Kill. Yeah, I had conflict. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who has the best taste in music? Leslie, us, both of us. We go, we go way to um, music fest. So we yeah. actually both music <laughs> fest. How old are you? Like Woodstock? <laughs> like what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You were the one. She went to Brian Adams. Oh. Hawks Bay, AC -DC. No, we went to ACDC. Yeah. We went to, to Shania Twain was the last one that we went to before you had to wear yeah, that. That's our thing. We go, well, Les calls up and said, let's book a ticket. And we go. Yeah, we oh, were yeah. asked to sit down because we were line dancing in the aisles and I feel a bit discriminated against actually about that. <laughs> it was in New Zealand. Shania you ever Twain. go to a country <laughs> event in New Zealand unless you're on the South Island? They're rubbish at it. <laughs> All right, so let me ask you this. So, Kelly, if I if I go to New Zealand and I come over to your house, what are you spinning on the record player? Um, uh, Ed Sheeran. <laughs> Does that spin? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. <laughs> Leslie, I go to Japan. Spin. No, Leslie, I go to Japan. What, what vinyl do you have? <laughs> Oh, uh, my house is Don't country say Ed Sheeran. classical, so I have no room to laugh at Kelly here. Can we go to the next question, please? No, 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 no. <laughs> Come on, Les. I just said. Who? What did you say? Oh, it's country music or classical in my home. What's wrong with country oh, music? Uh, it's ACDC during the warm-up. Nice. I, I can respect that. Yeah. Going to Japan, eh, Jamie? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think so. <laughs> All right, between the two of you, who is the best cook? Oh, never me. Uh, yeah, I don't think I am either, so. No. McDonald's drive through on the way home? Must be me. <laughs> <laughs> Must be you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I'll still make salads. Mm. Salads and oatmeal. Next question. All right. Catch. Who got or who still gets in trouble at the pub more? Mm. Oh, oh my yes. Leslie. It's been a while since I had an opportunity. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> She's in Japan. <laughs> That's right. All right. Cops come to break up a party. Who's getting picked up by the cops and who's getting away? I'm getting uh, away because I work. Yeah, Kelly's getting away. <laughs> but maybe you're not in New Zealand now. <laughs> okay, okay. Kelly's getting uh, away. She's faster. She's She's smarter, she's faster, she's more experienced with this kind of thing. I know where she grew up. Um, okay. I know the kind of people she used to play with and hang around with. She's getting away. I'm more naive. I would I be taking people. Yeah. <laughs> All right, last three, and you have to kind of answer these ones individually. Kelly, we'll start okay. with you. Who would play you in sure. the movie of your life? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Leslie, I'm Leslie. giving you a little bit more time to, <laughs> to think here. I appreciate that. Play me. Um, Does anyone have, have no fast idea. answers to this? Sorry? 
Does anyone ever have fast answers to that? Is anyone ever like, yeah, this guy? Some of them do, yeah. Some some are really quick and very conceited Here. in their answers too, and it's it's awfully Vicious. funny. A lot yeah, of Chris right. Hemsworth and things like that. Naturally. Oh, really? <laughs> um, uh, can I pass? Let's you go first and I'll think of it. I'm still thinking. <laughs> Accuracy is really important. Like, I'd really hate to misrepresent myself here. So I'll what, give you an answer towards the end. It doesn't have to be somebody that, you know, you think you look like, but maybe just somebody that can embody your personality. Oh, Leslie's really? more freaked out now than she was at first. Kelly. <laughs> <Hello. laughs> I'll play you. You can play me. Yeah, that's a hard one, Jamie. Do you either mm. have acting skills? Not, no, not at all. No, no, not even any like, kids have, on the bus. And Keanu Reeves. Like Keanu Reeves would play me. No, I just wow. <laughs> he could do oh it. Good Canadian guy, well rounded. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <Okay. laughs> it's it's hard to it's okay. We, we you don't have to answer those. That's absolutely fine. But it just means I can't ask you the last two questions because they're all tied in. What are the next few questions? Who would play the leading opposite? All oh, these are terrible questions. They're hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and then the last one was, what would the movie be called? Oh. Oh. Those are hard. I can't believe Jeez. you trashed my, I... my, my questions, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely... I don't know if I want to edit that part out or highlight that part. <laughs> <laughs> you may. Who would play you, Jamie? Who would play you in your movie? <laughs> Russell Crowe. Oh, oh, I like Russell Crowe. He's played in hockey <laughs> movies. He used to own a rugby team. It kind of goes hand totally. in hand, right? True, true. Totally. All right. What, what? Uh, Goldie Hawn, hey, last for you. Goldie Hawn. There Goldie you go. Goldie Hawn? Nice. What the? I like that. Because she did the, the that movie, Wildcats. Remember? Yes, the football movie. No, yeah, it was well movie. before my time. Sorry, well before my time. Okay, <gasps> Leslie, who would play Kelly? watch it. Who would play Kelly? <laughs> there we go. I'll, let, I'll come back. I'll come, I'll come back. back to that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. stumped Les. That's pretty good, Jamie. You stumped her. <laughs> yeah, I'll get really nervous about this. It's like, it's like making a choice among many similar looking toothpaste in the Japanese toothpaste <laughs> aisle. Like, which is the best? Don't pick the wrong one. I get real anxious about that kind of thing. About toothpaste. Well, about choices. Because <laughs> I could <laughs> play some Colgate if you need. <laughs> yeah. They probably well, have it in some form. It was chosen for me by my SNC coach because I stood there and I was like, you do it, please. So, yeah. <laughs> that's all right. That's fair. That's pretty impressive, Jamie. You stumped there. That's good. Tr like trouble it. with toothpaste is, is impressive too. So, it's, it's, <laughs> it's an ongoing thing. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll, we'll move beyond the quick fire section. Yeah. <laughs> that was a lot of fun, though. All right, so let's talk World Cup. You, you both played in a couple World Cups, and you both played in the 06 World Cup in Edmonton. What was that mm -hmm. experience like? Kelly, I believe you were the captain. What was that experience mm -hmm. like for the two of you there uh, at that stage in your careers? Um, well, I guess it's a little bit different for me and Les, because that was the end. I knew I was retiring after, so... Whereas Les is, Les is beginning doing it. So for me, it was, uh, um, I, I, had to, I had the thoughts. I've already had the motion. That's what I'm retiring, doing. Um, being in, in Canada was awesome, having everyone there. But Les and I talked about this earlier. Like, it, the pressures are completely different. When it's in, when it's in your own country, um, you don't realize how much pressure has effect on the team, the coaching, um, and everything until you actually get there. You can prepare the best you can um, as a team, but you can't predict. It's that, uh, and you know, it's just like COVID. It's being uh, the uncertainty of how pressure is gonna pressure the team. So um, that, that Les and I talk about this all the time. How do you prepare yourself for, you know, you're putting all this emphasis, like our big emphasis was we wanted to beat the Black Ferns in the first opening game and we got smoked. So it just really changed the complete um, the culture, I guess, the connections of the team, um, and we came back from it. We came back amazing because we beat Spain by, you know, we needed to beat Spain by, I don't think, like eighty points or something. We beat them eighty five, so we did come together um, and come back. But it's just, it was just interesting how being on your home turf and the pressure, how uh, the emphasis of pressure is on your team, and that's what I was saying. Less, um, less, you're saying no one's ever won. No female, uh, no um, women's World Cup team who held the World Cup has ever won at home. Yeah. yeah. So, mm. especially on New Zealand. But 
I was going to say, I don't even, I didn't even remember that we played Spain. I, that was our best game. We played Spain? Did you get concussed? Yeah. Game? Nah. Yeah. So like, before this morning when we talked, I told her about how I remembered, like, I just remember some, just a collection. I was young and I was overwhelmed and I was, um, I had the flu or something for the first bit. So I remember like in the morning, just throwing up a fair few times and then we played the game and I was on the bench and Heather Jakes was on the bench. And I remember her giving me her hamster, Steve, to hold when she went on. So she had to take a shot. <laughs> That's what I did too, James. <laughs> and she was like, I don't know this. I, was like, I, I don't know. want to hold the freaking hamster. I'm going to go on in a minute. I was really stressed. I was tense. I was at a like World Cup game and Jake's is like, here, was hold. Was it a service hamster? No. Yeah, it was like a, like an emotional support hamster. You meet Jake on the stand. I had no idea until she told me this half an hour ago. Yeah, Steve had a stressful World Cup as well because, as I recall, he was losing patches of his fur, so he wasn't even that cute. But I had to put him on the track pocket. I don't even know who I gave him to. So when I went on next, I had to give Jake's his hamster to somebody. It might have been Rox. I have no idea. I think it was Rox. She would have killed both of us. But this is our manager. I'm sure you met Roxanne Butler. Yeah, this is what I remember about the World Cup. Is like hamster duties, and then after that game, um, doing that fitness top up while everybody else, you know, talked to their boyfriends and their husbands and their family and ate popsicles. We were like, if you didn't play 60 plus minutes, you were hitting tackle bags, getting up, crying. I was spewing, crying. <laughs> that was the World Cup. Yeah, I don't remember playing Spain at all. Um, Rugby Canada sent us some commemorative. Swarovski crystal plates afterwards with the scores on them and they did that in both World Cups that I played on and uh, that must be on there but I would have shot that I think we shoot things in the fan we just save things if they don't work anymore we don't particularly care for them so I think I shot that hmm that'll tell you what my World Cup was like that last that last that's, that's interesting so but, but my 2002 World Cup, I don't remember hardly anything of it. And that I was probably the similar, you know, a couple of years experience into our first World Cup. I don't remember that hardly at all, that 2002 World Cup in Spain. So interesting, but I can remember everything about the 2006 one. Yeah. It's just so big. Like, I can remember more of the, 20, the 2010 one, but it's such a momentous thing. And like, it's something, it's not even mm. a big thing. It's not a big thing. Like, people even that have just been to a multi-sport games or like people that have been to a seven circuit stop will be like women's world cup not a huge thing but in your psyche it's a huge thing because it's everything you've aligned yourself towards for the last two three four years sometimes six seven years um eight years whatever and so it is a massive thing and if you if you haven't done it before and you don't know how to calibrate yourself and probably not many of us did and i've talked about this before like if you don't know how to how to stay measured about things like you're gonna come back with weird random memories like hamsters and popsicles and shit like that instead of yeah i recall playing spain really do not recall that huh i think that's fair but you know you're early on but is there something from 2010 that struck out you know stuck out for you that you know kelly wasn't there but as she said the the first world cup she doesn't remember a lot oh six she remembers a lot is it the same? Do you remember more about 2010? Oh, yeah. Like 2010, I was a difficult human being to be around anyways because I was trying to manage my way back from a neck injury and a couple of bad concussions that year. So I was not fun to be around. And yeah, I think just trying to get myself through that was enough of a challenge. And then we put ourselves under as much pressure as Canadian teams usually do. Um, I did love playing the States in our last game though. It was great. It was so much fun. Mm. But yeah, I just, I was really internally focused that whole time. And I think it wasn't great, but um, still there's nothing to complain about being in a world cup. So yeah. everything, everything think, makes you into what you end up being. So no regrets. 
And then as we always say, it's, you know, it's, I still talk to, we had the best team 2006, like our team, every single person on the team was just, you know, we're still, still in contact, like I, whether it be through Facebook or every once in a while during COVID, you know, me and Chris caught up, you know, just messenger and seeing, checking in, Sarah Ulmer, you know, it's, it, everyone always says it's the friendships and it really is like, it's, that, those are the memories that you remember. I remember having the coffees, you know, we had uh, our leadership group that we would just go away and say, hey, look, we're going for coffee. No one's to talk rugby for the next half hour. We're just talking about everything else. We were talking about Ranger coffee. The other day I was talking about your bloody Ranger coffees in the changing rooms before the games. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, that was Gallo. That was Gallo. Gallo brought that the shot. That was <laughs> Yeah, it's what a little power shot, and then it's a spoon of instant coffee granules in that, and then you shoot it, and then it's yeah. the most appalling way to take in caffeine. But like, she's a caffeine lord, so she would know. But yeah, Gallo was the instigator of everything. Just so you know, Jamie. Yeah, I think she admitted that when I was undoubtedly. <laughs> yeah, she would. Have. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let, let, let's uh, let's fast forward here to 2026. So five years out. 20 year reunion from that 06 world cup team. Hmm. What do you want those girls to be saying about you too? Like Kelly, if you, if, what do you think they're saying? What do you think those players are saying about you as a person from 06, as the captain, as a player on the pitch, what would you, what do you hope they're, they would say about you? Well, I don't think they'd say anything. I don't, the funny, like you said that question, they asked that question when you had given us the questions and I thought, it's just not something in our psyche to talk about, oh, you did this on the pitch, uh, you were this type of person. It, all of us were just, I don't know, it's hard to explain. Like, I just, I guess when you think of what you hope that they would say, it's just, I just was a part of the, like, part of the contribution of where women's rugby is going now. And that's all I want to be is just, I made it go forward in some way possible. I mean, that's solely, that was all my purpose. It's not whether I was the best this, the best this, or I helped. You were, though. Well. She was. She was no, the best. No, but, but it doesn't matter to me. That doesn't matter to me. All that matters is that I, I was a step, helping on a step to go improve rugby as a, as a sport, even in general. So I hope that that's what people would remember me as. I think Leslie thinks you're selling yourself short, but I think yeah. what you're saying sums up you so well because here's leslie still a good friend of yours who went to the 2010 world cup and remembered it more probably from what you helped her with in 2006 no not at all or I'm not at all <laughs> no she said no screw that <laughs> we were no. friends then jamie we it was friends. it was a nice moment for a second there but you know <laughs> moment Just <laughs> I want I want to make sure that Mark and I have some fodder to give her the gears later because she's been inducted <laughs> to all these hall, halls of fame so many halls of fame, <laughs> the hall of famer and she I have BC rugby hall of fame and BC sport right. hall of fame rugby yeah. Canada hall of fame yet have you got that one yet no, no. I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call them after I make apologies <laughs> for my there will be a huge phone campaign. That's right. Um, <laughs> but every time she is inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame, it just becomes more and more of a piss take Zoom session when her partner Mark gets on the phone. We have a couple of beers, so it's what. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So okay, Leslie. Same question. There you go. That her being yeah. Same question to you, Les. No, but we're gonna go to 20, 2030 because you don't want to be remembered for as the hamster person. No, that was Jake. That was Jake's. Yeah, but you carried the hamster. That's something. Yeah. yeah, you carried the hamster. You your minutes. choice, 2026 or 2030. What do you want those old teammates of yours to be? What do you think they'd be saying about you as a, as a person, as a player? Probably nothing I want to know, Jamie. Like, I do love them all. I love and... your honesty. It's, it's great. Hmm. <laughs> Explain yeah. further. I mean, I have heard people, people have told me in the past what they think of me as a player, and sometimes it's in the pub after a few beers. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. So I don't particularly want to script it myself. I've heard different versions. I apologize for some of them. But um, like I said, we all learn from our experiences. So yeah. But again, there's, hmm. there's beauty in that truth right there too. 
Like you're going, like you said in 2010, you were coming back from a neck injury. You probably weren't the easiest person to deal with, but you're owning that too, right? So I think I think that's there's beauty in that, truth and fairness in that as well. So that is another nice moment, Jamie. I think that actually, like Cal <laughs> is, good, he's a good proponent of that kind of reflection and honesty. And I'm being serious here, um, and it's one mm. of the reasons I've always looked up to her as a as a role model, like genuinely. As much as I tear strips off, I have always sort of I've held her up as since I was a young player with BC. Um, that's the kind of person that I want to be. That's the kind of career I want to emulate. She's always questioning. She's always learning. And she's oh, always... Her face is getting a little red right now, too. <laughs> You'll look the other way if you need to. But, like, she's a, <laughs> a real role model for me. And, um, yeah, it's that kind of measured honesty that she's always been really good at. And I've maybe, yeah, you know, I've been possibly too competitive for my own good at some times as a player. And I know that that has had its effects on people around me sometimes, but like, lots of You are who you are. You're being yeah. authentic. Yeah, and that's why you are where you are. Yeah. Yeah. So. Awesome coach. Let's tackle on it. Yeah, let's, let's talk about Leslie coaching in Japan. Like, how did you get there? What's your coaching philosophy? what was what was that how did you get a job as the head coach in japan kelly how did i get a job as the head coach in japan <laughs> 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 kelly was here before me um this is mm. gonna infuriate everybody who believes in meritocracy because kelly was here creating a good name a good reputation and getting experience with japan sevens and fifteens Years before I was, um, when she moved to New Zealand, I was working in New Zealand at the time in rugby development. I wasn't really coaching full-time, but I was in rugby full-time. And they trusted very much what she had to say and her judgment, which is lucky for me because they said, hey, Kelly, like, who's coaching in Japan right now on the women's side? And she gave them my information. And that yeah. is how I got here, ultimately. Hey. I really said, Les, there's only one person you want, and that's Leslie McKenzie. And that Ken went, yeah, that was it. Yeah. Pretty cool. So mm. you've taken that, you've run with it. Mm. What, do you, what do you try and bring to that Japanese squad? What are, you, what are your expectations going into the World Cup? And what can you tell us that's not going to get you in trouble with Japan rugby? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. I'm not going to tell you anything. <laughs> it was like, I don't trust you. <laughs> Just to let you know, for some reason that I can't explain, my pod on fair amount of occasions has been number one rugby pod in Japan, and I have no idea why. So oh. it's weird, <laughs> but I take I take it. Right? That's cool. Um, it's, it's odd. Yeah. Well, when I say that we're hoping to be, we're expecting to be, we're anticipating, knock on wood, obviously, um, to be the number one Asia seed as soon as we get our Asian qualification process sorted out in March, uh, we'll be in Pool B. So I'm not saying anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's, we'll leave it at that. There you go. There you go. <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's switch to you, Kelly. So you're in New Zealand. What's, it, what's the atmosphere there like with New, with New Zealand coming into the World Cup right now? Like it's, it's a few months out. COVID's great. I imagine there's measures in place for safety if COVID, you know, people with inoculations haven't, it hasn't happened yet. What are you, what are you sensing yeah. that's happening there? Um, well, it was exciting when they announced the draw. I don't know if you thought less. I don't know if you saw it, Jamie, but it was, it, they put a lot of priority. The prime minister was there doing the draw. And it just from, I think from that, people started thinking, hey, this is actually a really good deal. Mm -hmm. um, and that set it off. So, I was um, dying, by the way. That was the most tense moment. It was. was. It was a bit like the lottery. Yeah. <laughs> I was dying. I was at 338. It was so well done. Yeah. 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 Um, I think I went to Rick before Christmas. They had a meeting up here in, in Wangarei um, regarding because half the team, half the games are up here where I live. Um, and they said uh, they had a big, uh, people came to talk, uh, Keith Sadler came to talk and um, that kind of started everybody going, which was really good. And Christmas was a big break. But the big question was, you know, what happens if there's lockdowns and what, you know, New Zealand's 
booked for allowing people in until April. So, and you have to pay four thousand dollars if you want to come. And You're trying to scare people away from coming to support the Women's World Cup, Kelly. <laughs> Don't come. Well, to I have to be honest. You have yeah, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, be- which could easily be wiped by then. So, yeah. um, but they have to get on it if they're yeah booking the tickets. Um, yeah. But it's um, where we're holding it in in Bangray, in Bangray is uh, we've held the Lions there. We've held uh, the FIFA Under Twenty One Cup. Um, so they're quite used to the big events. Um, really cool. Really excited. And they and when they held the Rugby World Cup up here, the men's um, huge support. So. We're hoping there's going to be, well, it'll be mostly New Zealand based probably, but there's always that, that it's COVID, what's going to happen, but you just, they keep saying, we just got to plan like it's going to happen, so. Mm. Okay, well, on another note, yeah, I think you, you have to plan for it for sure, but there's always contingencies. Mm. Mm. What's, what's this, your, your research, I found that it's kind of interesting, emotional intelligence and sporting context, like what is that about? Yeah, so um, my other role, I, I lecture, but I also do work with the police and they get they with the health and wellness. So every two years, the police over here, all of New Zealand have to pass a physical. Um, and there's an obstacle. It's, it's not easy. Um, you have to go jump 1.8 meter fences, la, 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 la. So um, that's that context, that testing environment. Um, I measured what emotions were attached with that. Coming. So if they don't pass, and this is being, being a police officer, if they don't pass, then they um, are not allowed to be frontline officers anymore. So they have to be at a desk. Um, and you also get paid 1200 to pass the test, so they don't get the money. Um, so there's massive amount of emotions attached to passing this test and pressure. Um, yeah, so my, my research was on what happens in a testing situation, and it's it related to sport in where there's so much pressure on you where do your emotions go in terms of emotional intelligence? How do you manage your emotions? Um, how do you manage as a coach other people's emotions when they have these big um, pressure situations? And yeah, um, so that was, yeah, that was it. And um, the research that came out of it was what emotions that most people is uh, anxiety um, as we do in, in rugby by certain things. Like I, quite, I compared it to, you know, tackling high or coming to a, a playing a game that, uh, that you've always lost in or something like that. Um, but the underlying emotion of everything is shame. So um, for coaches to understand that it's not actually the test that they're, they're testing, um, it's actually what the underlying emotions and it's shame and it's where they're feeling shame from their family, they're shame that they've got themselves to this point, they're shame that they haven't practiced as much as they should have. Um, so it's really getting to those deeper emotions and and, and talking to your athletes and in my case the officers and bringing that out um, before they can even get over the obstacle you have to actually bring that out with them so it's a lot of like mentoring and coaching not coaching sport but coaching mm. to find like, out what those emotions are so that, yeah. that's the no-go mm-hmm. area for so many people like Kel, this is why i love talking mm-hmm. to kelly and just having such good sort of cross-grained conversations about what we're doing and how they fit into each other but that's a really, that's maybe the toughest area for people to get into is where their feelings of shame sit. Mm-hmm. And yeah. to be honest about that, like that's so mm-hmm. fascinating. Um, I agree. That's where like a mm-hmm. lot of my research is really interesting for me as a coach um, because it's, I think for anybody as a coach and then for anybody who works with people like yourself, Jamie, as a mm-hmm. coach or a teacher, it's mm-hmm. so interesting. Yeah, it's uh, my wife works in mental health and uh, I've mm. got a minor in sports psychology. And when I'm coaching in my class, I'm drawing on that or I'm, I'm bringing issues home to my wife and saying, this is what's going on. And she'll, she'll give me pointers like how to talk to students or ask them questions. And it helps tremendously just connecting in that way where, you know, the kid knows you're being authentic and that you're trying to help them. Yep. And the fact that, you know, what to look for and, and how to respond and things like that. So that's, that's really, that's really cool, Kelly. I like that. Um, I think that too, Jamie, that comes back to what you talked about character as a, as a coach, you work on yeah. the character, and you know them. Yeah. That's, yeah. I do want to ask one more question if it's all right. It's, it's not one that I had listed, um, but you both mm-hmm. mentioned the Lions tour um, at a couple of different stages. And I, I love watching the Lions tour. I think it's amazing. But at the same time, mm. it also kind of ticks me off as a Canadian 
um, because there's such a monopoly for those UK teams. All this money goes uh, to the you know to the UK for the Lions support and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and something as simple as you know Canada was supposed to play England while the Lions tour was happening. So basically, we're getting their B-side squad. So you're not getting a true measure. You're not getting the greats. You're getting the B-side. Yeah. I've I've kind of put out there a couple times to a few players that why can't we have like a an America's tour where you've got Canada, uh, U.S., Argentina, Uruguay, and maybe it's a three week tour to the U.K. or a three week tour to somewhere. What? How could that play out for a women's side? How could you start like a women's Lions tour or a variation of that? Could you? Do you want to? I think it would be kind of neat. I mean, I've heard it sort of posited before as well, but what's the motivation for it? Uh, I'd say attention. I'd say uh, fans. I'd say TV, potentially TV revenue, uh, exposure. Uh, I think there's probably a lot of positives. I think it would be a lot to get off the ground, and you'd probably need some uh, good financial backing to get it started. I just, uh, you know, for the women's game, I'm not sure where would you go, like what four or five countries would you band together and where would you take them? Right? Would it, but, would it, I mean, the whole point of the Lions tour is that there's a, a real historical significance to the, the nations that were banded together. Mm -hmm. So you don't get the kind of richness of, of feeling in the intensity of allegiance to the idea that you have of a, of a Lions team if you if you make it artificially like I think you've got to find the right motivation for it I think eventually you would get it but I mean based on what so you, I think people have had a difficult time trying to generate allegiance for artificially generated ideas so I think you've got to have real intent behind it and I think um for example, the Pacifica team they're talking about putting in the Super Rugby Comp mm -hmm. or the idea behind that. I think there's a genuine uh, intent behind that. There's a why. There's a lot of, of nationalism or um, pride in their islands and their people in their home that people don't necessarily in the islands get to see expressed when their son goes and plays for Australia or New Zealand. Yep. So I think that's where genuine intent comes from. And I think you would struggle to come up with the why unless you went deeper than mm -hmm. fan mm. Yeah, that's right. And I agree with the Pacifica team. I think that they should have been playing since professionalism started, you know, 20, 25 years ago. Um, I don't know. I just, one of those things I thought of, like maybe it'd be kind of a neat way to get more exposure to the women's game or to the America's side of the game. But yeah, that, that's a really good point. The history of the Lions, obviously. Um, if you could find a why and how to bring uh, you know, you know nationality or nations together, maybe there is a why, but you know, that's maybe beyond, that's beyond like my scope too. North America. So like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, those two teams, and especially in the last couple of years, I mean, especially let's be honest, the last 20 years, Canada and USA just default to each other when they need to have a game mm -hmm. or a couple of games. Sometimes they have training camps. That's a great relationship. Yeah. That's always a really brought physical emotional mental contest so that's where you could get some real possibly electricity when you put a couple of programs like that together to go and play an england or new zealand um but then yeah, yeah who are they playing so yeah that's the other but, thing yeah yeah anyway just one of those random thoughts yeah. i get when i'm teaching and not focused on what i'm teaching right so we're, we we all do that, right? Like us. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, girls. It's been a it's been a lot of fun. I've had a lot of laughs. Um, Leslie, uh, I'm a little scared of you, Kelly. I'm a little more comfortable with you, but I think that's. <laughs> you know, I'm a scrum half. I'm a retired scrum half, so I think that makes sense for your positions. Okay. But yeah. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, it's been a lot of fun, uh, Kelly. <laughs> Kelly, so best fun. of luck. You know, staying. Uh, active and everything down in New Zealand and Leslie good luck prepping for 2021 and I can't wait to see all the teams take the pitch there soon and uh, it's going to be very yeah. very enjoyable it's going to be brilliant yeah be right. yeah awesome awesome <laughs> thanks thanks for the invite Jamie it's been good yeah enjoyed that 
Uh, All right, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you very much to Kelly and Leslie. That was a lot of fun. Had a lot of great laughs with the two of you. Um, Really enjoyed uh, both your banter, both your insight to the game and your honest opinions about what's going on around the world of rugby. It's uh, it was awesome to see and awesome to listen to and awesome to be a part of. Uh, coming up next, I had a good conversation with Kingsley Jones and Rob Halley a couple of days ago, uh, talking about Rugby Canada and their direction of the men's program. Uh, right after that, we're going to have Evan Olmstead. He's on tap and ready to go. And then we have Marissa Pache, who is a chief marketing officer for World Rugby. She's a Canadian girl. We had a good chunk conversation as well. And we're still trying to uh, line up a date with Nick Blevins. Stephanie White and Hans de Goody, and always a host of others. But again, if you have any guests that you would like to join us, please reach out and let me know who you want to hear from, because uh, I think it's very important that we all get to hear from who we want to hear from. So uh, just drop me a line and let me know what you think. As always, going to thank you, listeners. Keep spreading the good rugby word. I love when you, I see those retweets or reshares or reposts uh, for these uh, interviews, for these rugby conversations, because it, to me, it shows that it, this is a great thing that people get a chance to listen to some great Canadian rugby icons and legends of the game or up and comers. So keep doing that. I always got to thank my son, Rylan, for supplying us with our tunes. Uh, he, he does the intro and outro music for us. It's been great. And lastly, this is Jamie. And until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane, and most importantly, keep on rocking.